doing a series of, um, I got a book contract to write a book on what was supposed to be a book on trans fats. And that came out of a story that I did for Gourmet Magazine, which really was the first story, major story to come out in the media on what, what was wrong with trans fats. This is 2003. And it was a huge article for Gourmet Magazine. Um, it was calling, you know, it was like documenting how the vegetable oil scientists were harassing and heckling scientists at conferences for raising problems about trans fats. I mean, it was really kind of an eye opener for me. And there, and I was given a book contract to write about trans fats. But then the deeper that I looked into this subject of fat, you know, what have Americans obsessed about? more than anything else in their diet, right? Good fat, bad fat, low fat, how much fat. I mean, all of that has been a central obsession. And I realized it was just a much bigger subject. And so my book, I mean, unbeknownst to me, my book ended up being about saturated fats and their replacement by vegetable oils. Although I didn't go into it thinking that. Um, yeah. It was also, you know, the first real compilation of information about seed oils and the problems, you know, of inflammation uh, and and uh, all of the toxic um, degraded um, fatty acid products that, that came out of it when you heat oils. I mean, that was that was all like that was the beginning. And of that you know, whole seed oil movement. Yeah. And let's dig into that a little bit more, because I think, you know, here we are, you know, now 20 years later from that. And I think a lot of people have sort of forgotten about the trans fat thing. You know, they don't <laughs> realize like how prominent this was, how this was pushed, you know, all of the low fat products that came out of the recommendations from the, you know, American Heart Association and the U.S. Dietary Guideline to get fat out of our diets. And, and, you know, these trans fats were introduced as a heart healthy fat uh, alternative. And it was a it was an unmitigated disaster. I mean, you know, uh, there's really no other way to put it. It 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 killed people uh, and it sort of quietly went away, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, there was a little bit of a movement, get trans fat out of everything. And, you know, the it, trans fat was removed from everything. Um, a lot slower here in the U.S. than it was internationally. Uh, but eventually, you know, and now here we are, you know, probably been, I don't know, 10, 15 years since the, you know, trans fat bans that it's not in anything anymore. And people have forgotten that and don't realize that, you know, it's very easy to see that we may have made the same mistakes, you know, in our evaluation of these polyunsaturated fats and these vegetable and seed well, oils. Here's why it's relevant today. Um, and, and really you have to go back to 1911 and the introduction of Crisco oil uh, and Crisco, you know, Crisco, the hardened oil, which was supposed to, and did come to replace lard. Okay. That was the introduction of vegetable oils into the American food supply. And I sort of documented how that, you know, they rose very quickly to become the dominant source of fat that Americans eat, right? There's even just since 1970, I mean, this goes back to 1911, but just there's, there's since 1970, our consumption of seed oils, you know, principally soybean, right? But cottonseed, safflower, sunflower, corn, that has risen 89% since uh in terms of our consumption since just 1970 right but it's if you look there's no food stuff no source of calories in the american diet that has risen more over the course of the last hundred years than seed oils so originally they they could and this is sort of still true today why it's relevant today they cannot replace you saturated fats they can't replace lard and butter unless you harden them right as oils they're useless for products on a shelf right they're oily products don't you know they just you can't make a shelf stable product with an oil so you have to harden it that process of hardening the oil is called hydrogenation and a byproduct of hydrogenation is trans fats trans fats happen to be just one of many novel never seen before 
individual fatty acids, but trans fats, you know, became uniquely identified were the subject of research going back to the 1970s, there were concern, major concerns about trans fats, which were largely ignored and suppressed. And the people studying that were the people I told you about who were heckled at conferences by industry scientists. So they got rid of trans fats, right? Rightly so. Um, and there was a whole campaign against trans fats, but what are we left with now? We have oils that cannot be hardened through hyd partial hydrogenation anymore. So in many instances, and particularly in fried food in restaurants, they've just gone back to using the regular old oils, right? The regular oils, the original reason that they were hardened is that they're wildly unstable as oils, right? They, they, they oxidize very quickly. They cause hundreds of degraded oxidation products. Those oxidation products enter into our bodies when we eat the food, the fried chicken nuggets or whatever the whatever's fried in them. They enter our body, they pass through the blood brain barrier. One of the toxic byproducts that is created is something called aldehydes, uh, which are known to cause cancer and heart disease. Um, they're so wildly unstable, they're almost impossible to study. But, you know, there's researchers who have studied these. I mean, this is science going back to Vienna. Wait a minute. I, whoa. It's unbelievable. And we're, we're, we're now... saying these oils that we're told to use to, to, for all of our cooking right. are so chemically unstable, they're extremely difficult to study. Yeah, because they're changing so rapidly. They're degrading so rapidly. So, I mean, if you go to a place like McDonald's. I, I keep have, thinking I can't be put... surprised anymore. And, <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, if sorry. You read this, but this section of my book is still like so raw. It's called Toxic Heated Oils. And when in restaurants, I mean, until McDonald's figured out how to put silicon beads into the oils to absorb the oxidation products or nitrogen blankets on top of the oils to prevent them from aerolizing, entering the, the, the uniforms of the workers. So the workers' uniforms were spontaneously combusting in the trucks on the way to the dry cleaners because they were so full of these unstable products. They figured out a way to control. This sounds that. like a, the script for the, the plot of a, of a of a of a sitcom or a sci-fi. This is insane. Okay, it is some scary reading. I mean, I'm not here to like sell my book, but I'll tell you, this is really scary reading and there and this problem has not been solved i mean that's why it's you know when you go out to eat at a restaurant the reason not to eat fried foods is you know maybe you don't want to overeat you know have excessive fats but the reason not to eat fried foods is because they're almost a hundred percent fried in these toxic inflammatory oils and that's the danger and and you know and and also the rise in vegetable oils perfectly parallels the rise in heart disease in America, right? I'm not saying that is the only cause. I don't think we fully know the cause of heart disease, but I mean, it's definitely not saturated fats, which have been declining. Animal fats have declined during the whole time that heart disease has been rising. So just going back to that particular point, but you know, vegetable oils are really to be, you know, feared, especially when they're heated, but even when they're just on your, you know, on your kitchen counter and they're the light, the heat, the the time they're there, they will eventually, they will oxidize and become rancid over time. Yeah, well, so, I've experienced that. They're really myself. scary. Yeah, no, it, it is really scary. And, and you know, there, there, there are plenty of videos you can pull up, you know, uh, uh, on how these things are made and, and just the insane chemical processes that they need to go through to make them palatable. And, and right. again, you know, this all started with Crisco, um, which was, you know, a company trying to find a way to use their industrial byproducts, you know, essentially, right. and right. make them because, edible. Right, what, right, because what happened was we need fat was used for lubricants in industrial machinery, right? So the late, 1800s, the industrial revolution happens. 
there's a tremendous need for fats. The whales, which had previously been the source for, you know, the use of, of, of oil in street lamps and, you know, have been used for all these purposes, candle making. We hunted, we hunted the whales practically to, to extinction. Then somebody figures out in America how to use the byproduct of cotton, cotton seed oil, and you can press oil out of those seeds. That became this byproduct. They didn't know what to do with it. They used it to lubricate machinery for the industrial revolution. That machine lubricant then became a foodstuff for us. Um, you know, really not having had you know any kind of significant exposure to human, you know, human populations just hadn't been exposed to that. And, and if you, you know, I really, I went through and looked through all the scientific research on going back, you know, to the, in the thirties and, and after, and, the, and looking at say, who was studying these oils? Why didn't we know anything about them? And you know, there was really a concerted effort to try to starve the oxygen out of that field of scientific research. So you see studies that are deeply concerning about, you know, animal studies where the rats are like, they've got shellac sticking themselves to the bottom of the cage because they've, because the oils harden um, and when they're metabolized. And, and this research, you know, these conferences, like nobody's sponsoring these conferences, there's no research, it just sort of goes quiet. And that, that actually remains the case today, that it's, it's, really difficult to get any research funded on these oils and there's there's almost no scholarship on them 